you may be a religious person, but can you explain why you are so? Can you, as Peter said in the Bible, give a reason for the hope that is within you? We trust that these video lessons will help you to draw nearer to the center of your web of belief. People who are religious but who cannot explain why are only emotionally religious. Their religion is not the kind of which Jesus spoke when he said people must worship God in spirit and in truth. Religion must be intelligent and honest, otherwise the web of faith will not have integrity. The deepest, most intriguing questions in life are those which are the most elemental questions. Therefore the answers are at once profound yet simple. As the spider's web is a wondrous yet elegant thing, so the reasons for being religious are both mysterious yet beautifully simple. No doubt there are many good reasons for being religious, but two reasons are outstanding and both of them are linked to death. No human being, no matter how rich or powerful, is able to escape death. We are to death as a mosquito to the spider who lies in wait. Death reaches out like the sticky strands of a spider's web and we are snared and conquered. The two reasons for being religious are these. First, you are going to die. Second, Jesus died for you. Across the world, someone somewhere dies every second or so. If that destructive power were concentrated in one large town, one day, its population would be wiped out by nightfall. The Bible verses you now see are from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. These link the two great reasons for being religious. First, you are going to die, and second, Jesus died for you. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Notice how you are pointed to your own death and what is beyond it. You are also pointed back to Christ's death and how you can be rescued from your own death by the death he died for you. These verses provide us with the theme for our six studies together concerning the death you are going to die and the death that Jesus died for you. In the rest of this first half hour together, we're going to look at the five facts about death. Firstly, Verse 27 says, It is appointed. And this is fact one about death. It is unavoidable. Secondly, it says, For men. And that means men in the generic sense, mankind, both male and female equally. And since you are one, then you are no exception to the appointment we must all keep with death. Thirdly, it says, once to die, with emphasis on the once. You only die once, and you have only one chance at life. Fourthly, it says, but after this, there is a hereafter. Death is not the end. And fifthly, the sentence finishes with these awesome words, the judgment. This judgment decides your eternal destiny. Since it lies just beyond death, death is your destiny's door. 
Death and judgment are things which God has appointed. Life in this world was never meant to go on forever. Its end was appointed. God meant man's life in this world to end. How many people die each day in the world? About once every second someone, somewhere, is struck by the arrow of death. In eleven days a million people will have died. Of course, millions of people will not die, but only because their lives in this world are brought to an end by the second coming of Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 Nobody can escape the fact that life in this world must, sooner or later, one way or another, come to an end. We have invented birth control, but nobody can invent death control. Nobody can cure death. It is foolish to seek immortality in this world. It is appointed that life in this world must end. What God once said to a man, he at some moment says to us all, This night your life will be required of you. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now let's go back to that theme text, Hebrews 9.27, where we saw the five facts about death earlier. The word men, as we said before, is generic and stands for all humankind. You could replace that word with your own name. And that would be to make a correct application of the text to yourself. We don't recommend changing the Bible because it's God's Word inspired by the Holy Spirit and we have no right to change anything. But we really change nothing in this verse when we put our own name in place of the word men. For we are one of those men. We are one of humankind. And this verse applies to each one of us personally. Nothing short of the second coming of Christ at the end of the world can accept any one of us, including you, from death's visit. At the beginning of this video, we quoted some passages from Ecclesiastes 12 and Psalm 90. Remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel is broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. The length of our days is seventy years, or eighty if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. These words are usually reserved for funerals, but in fact they are words for everyday life. It may seem to you that the general tenor of this lesson so far has been somewhat morbid, but I prefer to call it realistic. The fact of death and of the coming judgment is real, and it's a fact that is with us, whether we like it or not, every day of our lives, moment by moment. The Bible in many places explains to us that death, physical death, 
is something that comes to all mankind and we no don't know when it will come. For example, here in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is just one example of many passages in the scripture that show us that the Christian's attitude should be one of I could die today, I could die tomorrow. In this world I'm just an alien, I'm just a stranger, I'm just a pilgrim. And I don't know when God is going to come and visit me. Now, God can visit us with death or he can visit us with judgment. But one way or the other, we're going to find that our lives end. We're going to die physically or we're going to be here when Jesus comes a second time and we're going to stand before God in judgment. And we must face this fact and be realistic about it and be aware of it in our daily lives. Just ignoring it, just forgetting about it, that doesn't help. Over in James, just a few pages back in James chapter 4, we have James telling us a very similar sort of thing. Verse 13. Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, and all such boasting is evil. Well, here James is explaining to us that the attitude, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, without considering God's will, and whether God intends for you to live or die today or tomorrow, that's an attitude of boasting, really. It's an arrogant way of living. But when you place yourself under the will of God, and you say to God, my life is but a mist, it appears for a little while and vanishes away, and my destiny, Lord, is with you, and when you will, then I will die, and I will stand before you in judgment when you will. And that's what my life is aiming towards. Well, that's a humble attitude. Now, God resists the proud, but he exalts those who are humble. And one of the real reasons for being religious and worshipping God is that we realize, and I mean realize in the strongest sense of that word, we are realistic about the fact that death comes to us all, and it nearly always comes unexpectedly. There is no guarantee about how long we will live in this life, and there is only one certainty, and that is that we will stand before the judgment seat of God to give account of ourselves. That is a very good reason to be religious. There are only two exceptions ever recorded of people who avoided death. One of them was Enoch, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The New Testament explains that by faith Enoch was translated so that he did not see death. So Enoch was one man who avoided death. The other was Elijah. His life on earth ended in a unique way. Suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. But the experience of Enoch and Elijah is not really unique, except for its timing. For all men and women of faith will be translated, even those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We have been thinking about Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed 
for man wants to die and after this the judgment. In this text we find five facts about death, two of which we have already so far considered. The first phrase, it is appointed, shows us that death is unavoidable. We can do nothing to stop that inevitable appointment with death whenever it comes. The second phrase, for man, which means man, both male and female, shows that no one can expect to be an exception. You are no exception. Nothing short of the second coming of Christ will accept you. The third phrase, once to die, shows us that this is a one-chance world. You only die once. We will talk about the ramifications of this in a moment. The fourth phrase, and after this, is very significant. It shows that to die is not the end, as many suppose. There is something after death. The fifth phrase is the judgment. Death is a doorway to that final judgment and eternity beyond. The portion of text we have so far enlarged upon is now on your screen with its two facts. Death is unavoidable and you are no exception. That completes the main part of our study. In the balance of this talk, we look briefly at the rest of the text, the last three facts being, you only die once, Death is not the end, and death is your destiny's door. When I was just a skinny brat, and I know some of you will say you're still a skinny brat, you've just grown whiskers, that's all. But when I was really a skinny brat, I lived on a little farm, and we had two haystacks, a small one, and then a huge haystack. And over the huge haystack there was this very large shed with a corrugated iron roof. And we used to be able to climb up onto the roof, very high, very dangerous. But we'd jump over the edge and land on the small haystack. It was a, quite a drop. And then just beyond the haystack there was a dam in which the ducks used to swim, a dirty, muddy dam. Well, of course, it was rather daring to jump off the big roof onto the haystack and not manage to fall into the dam. Or, apart from that, to fall onto the hard ground and miss the small haystack. We had a little saying. It was, you can only die once. And so it was the custom for my friends and I to get up on this big shed Sing out, you can only die once and jump off and try and land on the small haystack, which we invariably did until one day. I well remember one young lad who was not quite a, as good at dying once as the rest of us almost did die. He missed the haystack and he landed on the hard ground and broke an arm and a leg. Fortunately, he didn't kill himself and he soon got over it. But what a silly attitude. You can only die once, and therefore you take risks, and you be reckless. That doesn't make sense, does it? That's the sort of thing children do, but uh, unfortunately some grown-ups have a very similar attitude. You can only die once, therefore you might as well live your life with reckless abandon, and not worry about God, not worry about eternity, not worry about anything. You've only got one life to live, and you only die once, so you might as well just be stupid and reckon that you're enjoying yourself. Well, what sort of an attitude is that? If you do only die once, and you do only live once, then surely it makes a lot of sense to make the most of that life, and to treat it as a treasure, and to do with it whatever you were meant to do with it. There are some people, of course, who don't believe you die once. They believe you die many, many times, a multitude of times, and you come back over and over again. They call that reincarnation, and you've probably heard of it. Some people say that reincarnation is taught in the Bible. When John talked to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again, in John chapter 3. But of course, Jesus was not talking there about physical birth. People there get confused between spiritual birth and physical birth, just like people get confused between spiritual death and physical death. The Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. It says it's appointed to man to die once. 
And if you only die once, then I appeal to you, make the most of the life you've got before that death takes place. Still harking back to the days when I was a brat, but uh, a teenage brat, I was able to buy my first car, a lovely white FJ Holden. I wish I had it now. And I'm going to make some of you very jealous, tell you how I got my first driver's license just quickly. I had to drive the policeman down to the newsagents to get a newspaper and then drive him back to the police station again. There were only half a dozen shops in the main street, so it wasn't very difficult to do. On the way back, he said, you see that lane over there? And there were two buildings with a narrowish lane between them. He said, you think you could go up that backwards? I said, yes. He said, well, don't bother then. I'm in a hurry. We got back to the police station. He asked me about three very simple questions, asked me to read the top line on, uh, on uh, the site board and asked me the colours of the traffic lights. And that was it. I got my license. Very easy. A lot of people got their licenses easy in those days and were very reckless drivers. And uh, many of them, through their recklessness, speed and drunk driving and so on, they killed themselves. And so they put an advertisement on the wireless. And in that advertisement they said, in very sonorous tones, Death is so permanent. I can't quite imitate it. It sounded even uh, more impressive than that, but death is so permanent. Well, you know, that wireless advertisement was wrong. Death isn't permanent. One day there's going to be a resurrection of the dead, the Bible teaches. Both the righteous and the wicked, everyone will rise from the dead. But what comes after that is permanent. Our text says, after this, the judgment. And beyond the judgment, there is either eternal life or eternal condemnation. And that's permanent. Oh, so very permanent. So I appeal to you that you make this life before you die a time of searching, a time of preparation, for your eternal destiny. You've only got the one chance. You only die once, but death is not the end. After that comes the judgment. Please be ready for that judgment. Jesus said, The hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just a little thing to notice there in that last reading, the fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for you, not for me, not for humankind, but for the devil and his angels. And yet you could end up in that fire. So could I. How can we escape it?
the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you are in Christ Jesus, then there is no condemnation. And you can look to your death as being the doorway into eternal glory, into that everlasting and wonderful kingdom that God has prepared for you as long as you are in Christ Jesus. How do you get into Him? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ now that's how you get into Christ there's no condemnation in Christ how do you get into him well through faith you are baptized into him all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek slave nor free male nor female for you're all one in Christ Jesus if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's a wonderful inheritance that can be yours. You can be an heir of God. What a wonderful inheritance to look forward to. If you become a believer in Christ and are baptized in his name, repenting of your sins, then you have this hope as an anchor for your soul. And you can be ready for death. You can make your destiny sure. Thank you for watching. You are invited to visit simplybible.com.